also remind you that the Vision magazine is there for those who have um, ordered it. So please remember that. Also, we have this book, which is called Mental Health and the Christian. Uh, a number of these copies were provided to your congregation. They all went last uh, week. So we're going to try and get more for the incoming weeks for I know there's many people looking these so they're certainly excellent and wonderful scriptural advice for people at a difficult times so we certainly pray the Lord will bless this little booklet we do want to turn in our Bibles to first Kings and the chapter number 19 first Kings and the chapter 19 whenever I was praying and preparing for it this year uh, I felt led to divide the year into three parts of four months, and we're now a third of the way through our year, if the first four months are over. And in those morning services, I planned to preach through the book of Matthew as far as I could go in that time. And then in this middle section, in the will of the Lord, for the next four months, I want to do a character study on the life of Elisha. And in the will of the Lord... Uh, should we all be here and spared uh, in the final third of the year I would like to go back to the Psalms and continue our study through the book of the Psalms so that's my plans at the minute of course they can change but certainly that's the way I felt led and I pray that the Lord will bless this study to all of our hearts as we look at this character of Elisha and the wonderful ministry that God gave him and the lessons that we can learn from it so we are going to read from verse number 13. And we are introduced actually here to Elijah, first of all, because he is very important in the life and story of Elisha. So we're coming to 1 Kings 19, verse number 13. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering end of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I be very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, Return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Mohola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, and all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which have not kissed him. So he departed thence and found Elisha the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with twelve. And Elijah passed by and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people, and they did eat. Then he arose I went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy word, for thy truth. And we pray, Lord, that thou will write it upon our hearts, that the principles of Scripture will be made real to us today. We will live our lives by them. We will know what it is to be faithful before God in our generation, in our church, in our families. We pray, O Lord, that thou wilt be pleased to Undertake for uh, the preaching of thy word. Give me help, I pray. Empty me of self and sin. Fill me with thy spirit. And give me help to deliver the word of God. To the glory of thy name. For Christ's name we pray. Amen 
and amen. Elisha appears on the record of scripture sometime around 800 BC, 800 years before Christ, approximately 200 years after King David. He's closely associated with Elijah because God used Elijah to anoint Elisha and to give him some training in his early ministry. Now, a drought had occurred for three years, over three years, during the ministry of Elisha. Elisha went, or Elijah went before the king and told them that the land of Israel was going to become barren because of the wickedness of the king and the wickedness of the land. God judged the land that rejected him. If you turn back to chapter 17 and verse number 1, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. You see, there were consequences in Israel because of their behavior and their attitude toward the Lord. It was John Calvin, the great reformer, that once said, when God wants to punish a nation, he gives them wicked rulers. Nahab was a wicked ruler. His wife Jezebel was an extremely wicked woman. And they brought a great influence of Baal worship into the land. In fact, it seems to be that it was Jezebel specifically that brought this into the land. If you turn to chapter 18 and verse number 19, it says, Now therefore send a gather to me all unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal 450 and the prophets of the groves 400 which eat at Jezebel's table. So the idea was that Jezebel the queen had taken it upon herself to sustain the false prophets in the land. And of course, if the favor of the king or the queen was upon them, then there was protection for them. And nobody could say anything against them. And as a result, the wickedness spread entirely throughout the land. So Elijah calls the children of Israel together after three years of drought and famine in the land. They're called to Mount Carmel. And we all know what happened that day. We know that the altars were made. The sacrifices were placed upon the altar. The people and the priests of Baal uh, ran around the altar, they cut themselves, they called on to their gods. Elijah mocked them, maybe they're sleeping, shout louder, shout louder. And then we know that Elijah prayed that God would prove himself. And upon a sacrifice and upon an altar that had been submerged with water, God sent the fire. He proved that he was God. And interestingly, if you look at verse number 39 of chapter 18, and then when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. What we need today is a move of God. That even the ungodly will have to stand back and say, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And that was a great victory. Imagine how Elijah must have felt that day as he came down the mountain. As he went to sleep that night. Praise the Lord. What victory there is. Our God is alive. Our God is all powerful. There's nothing too difficult for him. But you know, great victory was followed by great discouragement. Don't you think that the devil is going to allow you to go untouched if you are serving the Lord and going through with God? And in chapter 19, verse 1, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword, all the prophets of Baal. Then Jezebel sent the messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose, and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. What Jezebel was saying, I have 24 hours to take your life. 
And if I don't have you killed in 24 hours, may I be killed by the gods that I serve. Of course, her gods were false gods. But she put out a threat upon his life, 24 hours, and I'll kill you. God allows his people to face difficult times. There's no doubt about that. Oh, there's a false gospel. It's called the prosperity gospel. There's no gospel at all. It's no good news. Because the message of that particular gospel is that if you are good enough or you're uh, strong enough or if you have enough faith, there's nothing that you have to face as of any difficulty. No sickness, no financial worries, no health troubles, no family troubles, no times of discouragement, just have more faith, just pray more, do your best. And they look at people lying on beds of sickness saying, you don't have enough faith, as if they haven't enough trouble. Somebody coming preaching a heresy of hell. Friend, read the scriptures. Show me one person that didn't have trouble. Even the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Perfect, pure, and holy. It would be impossible to be any more holy. And he was a man of sorrows. So let us not think that we will be immune to difficult times. What the preacher needs to preach from the pulpit I tell the people of God is this, how to deal with difficult times. Not some fairy tale that there's no such things, but how to deal with difficult times. And one thing I love about the scripture is this, this is a real book. You know, whenever you read of people's obituaries or you read sometimes of the life that they lived, they pick the good parts, don't they? The highlights. The things that they're proud of, the things that are nice and easy to listen to and look to. The Bible gives everything warts and all. We see the highlights of the prophets and the disciples and the apostles and the people of God. We also see the times they failed. And they did things that were wrong. And in this case, Elijah did something foolish. And that should be a lesson to us when there's great victory and there's blessing and things are going well for us spiritually. Be careful because you're only one decision away from doing something foolish. And here's what he did. He wanted to give up. He wanted to give up. If you look there, verse number four, he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He went to a place that was barren. And he came and he sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough now, Lord. Take away my life for I'm not better than my father's. Lord, it's enough. Too much. I can't go any further. It's too hard. Give it up. Just take me home. This was a great and mighty man of God but he had dark and difficult days. So don't you ever feel isolated or alone? Don't you ever feel as if you're the only one walking this pathway? But you know, even though that was a cry unto the Lord, is it wonderful that God doesn't always give us what we desire? Because of verses five to verse number eight, we see that God provided for his child. As he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water in his head, and he did eat and drink and laid him down again. Then the angel of the Lord came the second time and touched him. He said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the Mount of God. You see, he didn't ask for a touch from an angel. But God sent it. He didn't ask for food and drink, but God sent it. He didn't ask for a word from heaven or encouragement, but God sent it. And isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful? Men and women, boys and girls who are saved. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes we can't pray. We've all been there. We just can't in our head get to the point where we cry out to God. God doesn't forsake us. He sends the blessings. The things that we haven't even asked for. Why? Because as a father pitieth his children. So the Lord pitieth them to fear him. Go 
God gave him each of these things. Even we don't or we cannot ask, he often sends provision to strengthen us, a word to guide us, a touch to encourage us. Where did he lead Elijah to in his dark days? He called Elijah and he told him to go arise and eat because this journey is too great for thee. Where did he bring him to? He brought him to Mount Horeb. What is Mount Horeb? Sinai. What's significant about Sinai? It's a mountain of God. It's a place where God met with his people in a miraculous way. It's the place of teaching because it's the place where God gave the law. And God called him to the place of scripture, to the place of teaching, to the place of his word and his voice. And I have no doubt that the purpose of God in calling him to make that journey, that long journey was this, as he was going to Mount Horeb, his idea was, well, that's the place where God did this, and that's the place where God did that, and that's the place where God gave this word, and the word of God will be going over in his mind. That's the place where God had dwelt among his people. When Elijah came to the place, directed, which God had directed him to, God spoke and showed him the next step. He had to take the first step, which was a rise. Then God showed him the next step to go. And then God gave him the next instruction. And sometimes we're so worried about what about next week or next year or next month? What about this or that? All that's required of the Christian today is to obey the command of God for now. What's God asking you to do today? Does he ask you to be still? Know that I have God? Is he asking you to trust him? Is he asking you to step out of faith in some particular area in your life? Is he asking you to reach your family? Is he asking you to give up some sin? Is he asking you to act obedience to some command? Well, we now come to the voice of God. And when the Lord asks Elijah what the problem is, we have a reply that we all can identify with. He felt full of self-pity, and he also had a lack of faith. We've all been there. This is a man of God, a great man of God, a man whom the Lord tells us in the book of James to look back to. And this answer is given in verse number 10, a verse number 14, and it's the same answer. The Lord speaks to him twice. And it's the same answer. I have been very jealous for the Lord of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. That's correct. That is correct. But he goes further than reality. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Just me, Lord. I'm the only one who did anything for you. I'm the only one who's faithful. Lord, I'm the only one in the whole place you could depend upon. And now look, they're after my life. It's interesting to note that between verses 10 and verse 14, there's something that happens. Elijah is told to stand upon the mount in verse number 11. Behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountain, a break in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering end of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here? So between these verses, verse 10, verse 14, he stood stand upon the mountain. There's a wind, there's earthquake, there's fire. And then there's a still, small voice of God. Why is that significant? Well, the first time God visited there 
in Sinai, he visited with lightning, flashings of lightning and fire. What God had visited at Mount Carmel a few days ago during the great challenge to the prophets of Baal, what did the Lord do? He visited by fire. But God was now speaking in a different way. God was speaking with a still, small voice. And that reminds me that God is always speaking. God is always speaking, but he speaks in different ways at different times. He takes his word and applies it effectually to different hearts in different ways at different times. God is always speaking. And sometimes, yes, it is in the big dramatic things. Sometimes it is in the winds of revival. Sometimes it's in the fire of affliction or preaching. Sometimes it is in the time of the earthquake when the earth is shaken, but God is obviously teaching or moving. But more often than not, it's with a still small voice. Sometimes we love the drama and the excitement and all of those things. And it's exciting to be in the middle of a revival, exciting to be in a time of great blessing, and it's easy to come and open your Bible to hear what God's going to say in this real move of God. But sometimes we're not in that period. Yes, the Lord's moving, the Lord's blessing, but there's not that fervor of revival or there's not scores of people coming to Christ. Friend, God is still moving. But for some people, oh, well, no, I'll not bother. I'll just leave the Bible go away. It's not what it used to be. Do you think God's still not moving? Do you think God's still not blessing? Do you think God doesn't have a message for you today? You see, God is always speaking. The question is not, is God speaking? The question is, are you listening? And friend, if your attitude toward the voice of God is I will only hear it on a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening in a church building because I do not listen any other time, then that's wrong. Dear Christian, this morning, who's weary, there's a word of comfort for you, but you need to open the book. Dear Christian, confused and unsure of how to go forward, there's a word for you, but you need to open the Bible. God is speaking with a still small voice. Are you waiting? Are you seeking? Are you desiring? Are you expecting his voice? How hard it is for us to be in silence. I think we're scared of silence. We're scared to sit alone with our thoughts and think. It's easier to have a podcast on or a CD or to have something playing in the background. Even the television on with the noise. You're not watching it, but it's just nice to have comfort, isn't it? But have you taken time to sit and listen to the still, small, voice of God. And it's not that God's not speaking. But sadly, sometimes we're too busy. And God spoke to Elijah, and as he did so, he dealt with all his problems. You see, he told Elijah, there's still a work for you to do. Elijah wanted to leave, and the Lord said, but hold on, there's still a work for you to do. And if the Lord gives you a work to do, then you know there's going to be success because the Lord doesn't cause you to do something that's vain and empty. There's still a work for you to do. Verse number 15, he said, go, return thy way to the wilderness of Damascus when thou comest anoint, and we'll, we'll not go through those verses, we've already read it. So there was still a work for him to do. Then there was still a people for him to speak to. He had to speak to the king of Syria. He had to speak to the king of Israel. He had to speak to the new prophet that was going to take over his place whenever the Lord called him home. So there were still individuals that he had to speak to. And there was still a remnant who were faithful to the Lord. Do you remember Elijah? Oh Lord, I'm the only person here. Nobody else faithful, just me. Well, the Lord said there was actually 7,000 in the land. Isn't it wonderful how we can have a, a very foolish perspective and blow ourselves up to be something greater than we are. Isn't it wonderful that if you're here in this state of time, friend, there's still a work for you to do. There's still people for you to speak to. There's still the people of God for you to fellowship with and work together with. And it's interesting to note that the Lord had authority over who was appointed in Syria, which was a Gentile nation. And the Lord gave the instruction who was to be appointed over Israel, which was a Jewish nation. And the Lord gave an appointment who was to be the next preacher or prophet of the day. And that was over his ministry. The Lord's in control of it all. 
The Gentile nation, the Jewish nation, his church, the Lord has full authority. And interestingly, he said in verse number 18, I have left me 7,000 in Israel. And that's the 7,000 faithful. And those words, I have left me, have the idea I have reserved to myself. It could also be translated remnant. There's a remnant of 7,000 whom I have reserved for myself. And how wonderful to know the Lord will always have a testimony. He will always have a church. He will always have a witness because we, and they, were saved by the Lord and kept by the Lord. That 7,000 were there, not because they were good people, but because the Lord had preserved them. And friend, we're here today. And I know there are people in this gathering, some have been saved for months, some have been saved for decades. And the only reason we're here today, continuing to walk with God, is because he has left us unto himself, or reserved us unto himself. He will keep us. And as long as you're on this earth, there's a work for you to do. You have a testimony to uh, maintain as a Lord's ambassador. And there are people today, and I know there are people struggling with this. What can I do? Preacher, I am so restricted by my circumstances. Maybe it's age, maybe it's sickness, just current circumstances where you can't be out and about and you can't be in people's houses at this time in our nation's history and you maybe have the freedom to be in crowds of people, to speak to people. What can I do? What can I do? Well, you can shine for the Lord wherever he's placed you. Being faithful to the Lord doesn't necessarily mean preaching doesn't necessarily mean standing uh, one-to-one, evangelizing someone. That's not just what it means. It means that every moment of your life that you're shining for Christ in your daily living, in your workplace, in your home, in your school, in your social activities, you know, that you are shining. Think about the street lamp as you walk down the street. That street lamp doesn't move. What does it do? It just shines. But what a difference it makes to the people that come into contact with it. They're grateful for it. They're happy for it. For a few days, the lights were out for some reason, the Califati Road, and I was going out at night, and I couldn't see a thing in front of me. I had the uh, torch on on the phone. It was black. And I was glad when the lights were turned back on again. Friend, are you the light that's shining for Christ? People might only be in your presence for two minutes, ten minutes, half an hour. But friend, are your, is your life making an impact because it's shining brightly for the Savior? You see, your worth is not in your position. Your worth is not in your finances. Your worth is not in your name or your talents and your abilities. Your worth is in Christ. Shine for him. Live for him. Make that be the center of who you are and what you are. Because in Christ, he declares us to be precious, to be loved, and to be blessed. How can we not but shine for him? Christian, this morning you're loved by the Lord. You're precious to the Lord. You're blessed of God. And praise God, we can shine brightly for him. Maybe we can't do anything else. We can be godly and Christ-like, how we interact with people, how we conduct ourselves, how we live our lives, when we God give us grace to shine. And then thirdly, we thought about, first of all, we thought about great victory as sometimes followed by great discouragement. And secondly, we thought about the voice of God. But thirdly, and we do come to this, suppose the focus of what we're starting today, the call of Elisha. The call of Elisha. Now, so much of the Lord's working in Elisha's life is not known before his call. So he's out as a farmer in the field. He's plowing with the oxen. And while he's doing that, miles away, God is speaking to Elijah and revealing unto Elijah that this is the man that's going to take your place. Now, Elisha didn't know about it at the time. He was not aware that the Lord was speaking to Elijah. Of course not. He was not aware of God's plans for him in service, but God revealed his will for Elisha in his perfect time. So what was Elijah doing? And I think this is very important. We find that Elijah had a testimony. First of all, he was one of the 7,000 of the land who loved the Lord. How do I know that? Because the Lord doesn't call an unsaved man to serve him. He was one of the remnant. He 
He was one of the saved. He was one of the faithful. Not only that, but his name, Elisha, means God is my salvation or God has salvation. So even by the very name that he had, that was a testimony. His character, he was engaged in honest work. An honest day's work. He went out into the field, he plowed with the oxen, gathered the crops and all the things that he had to do, and he had a work ethic. So therefore, this is a godly man. He had a testimony through his name, through the fact he was one of the people of God, through his character. He was living in a godly manner, engaged in honest work, serving the Lord. And remember, we are servants of God. We are servants of God. And we must major on the fundamentals of the faith as the servants of God. We must major on the fundamentals. What do I mean by that? Well, the fundamentals of the faith of this are conduct. It must be in keeping with the Bible. Our character, it must be a reflection of the Lord. Obedience to God's revealed will. You cannot call yourself a servant of the Lord if you're living in disobedience to God. It's nonsense. And therefore, if there's an area in your life that you're struggling with or something in your life that you know is wrong, that God does not want you to do, God does not want you to be involved in, get before God today, get repented of it, get it under the blood and ask for God for grace to live without it or live in victory over it and the Lord will give you grace. Now, the big problem is sometimes with Christians is it's not that they can't have victory. They don't really want victory over it for they don't mind having a bad temper. They don't mind telling a wee lie here and there. They don't mind cheating people out of money. They don't mind uh, flirting with people who are not their husband or their wife. That's just who they are and that's the way they go. No, no, no. If you're a servant of God, you're obedient to the Lord. It's your obedience that shows who you truly are, who you're serving. Is it the flesh or is it the Lord? And here's a man we know that he was serving the Lord. And the Lord clearly revealed his specific will for Elisha's life. Now we know there is a general will of God for us all. Obedience, holiness, love for brothers and sisters, etc. But he had obeyed those things. He was living in a godly manner. And therefore, the next step was that God gave him his specific will. Now, you cannot go before the Lord, Lord, where do you want me to serve thee full time? Where do you want me to go and preach? Where do you want me to do this and that? If you're not obeying the general will, if you're not majoring in the fundamentals and the basics, if you're not obedient, don't you worry about the specific will of God. Get the first things done first, and then the Lord will take you on the next step. And his call was done by, verse 19, a mantle was cast upon him. Now, one of the Bible commentators says, this is indicative of his investiture to the prophetic office. But it was also a sign of friendship that Elijah would take him under his care and tuition. So by putting his mantle upon him, this was a symbol, I want you to come with me, you'll live with me, you'll work with me, you'll train with me, for God is calling you to higher service. Now, Elijah reminded Elisha that this was a matter between him and the Lord. And you'll notice that because Elisha says, let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. Now, I don't believe this was disobedience. I don't believe this was a disobedience at all. In fact, I believe it was the opposite. I believe it was an immediate response saying, yes, I'll go. I'm just going to say goodbye to my parents. And that was good, and that was right, and that was proper. He was eager and ready to go. But Elijah did what the Lord did a few weeks ago to some of the people who wanted to follow him outside Capernaum. Told him to stop and count the cost. And that is what Elijah did. Uh, he said in verse 20, at the end of verse 20, go back again, for what have I done unto thee? And the idea here is don't act impulsively. Stop, go over what I've said. Think about it. Count the cost before you definitely commit yourself. Now, he wasn't discouraging him, but he's being honest with him. Because you see, there was a cost. He was a loving son. He had to leave his home. 
He was a well-resourced farmer and he had laid behind his employment. Now, he would enter into a blessed work, of course, but there were going to be many enemies. So he had to think about these things. And what Elijah is essentially saying, what have I done unto thee? Elisha, I'm not calling you. God is calling you. So it's not between me and you what you do. It's between you and God. As I thought about that, how important it is that we are very careful as Christians how we speak to one another and how we influence one another. Some people, you see, would seek to influence others. Oh, you should go at the Bible college or you should go into the mission field or you should go into the ministry or you should go into this work or that work. Give up your home, give your employment, your current circumstance, go into full-time service. Friend, that's not your work or my work to do. Any call that will be placed upon any heart will only come from the Spirit of God. God can call. God does call. He calls clearly. He calls specifically. You know that and I know that. And therefore, let us not in pray take the place of the Lord say, oh, I think you'd be great for the ministry. Because if the wrong person goes into a ministry, they'll not only wreck themselves, they could wreck the work of God. And therefore, let the Lord do the calling and the choosing. He will call, he will guide, and he will equip. So what can we do? We can pray for the people whom the Lord is leading, that the Lord will bless them and give them help to be obedient. We can pray for them as they go through their training and their ministry. We can support them financially, but never try and push people because you think they're suitable. Because, friend, that can be very dangerous. The Lord is able to do this uh, to those whom he chooses. We're almost through. Elisha was willing to obey the call of God. So he left what he had. And he, first of all, sorry, he made a feast. And he made the feast out of the animals that he farmed with. So this literally was saying goodbye to his livelihood. He slew the animals, made a feast for the wood. It says there that he used the instruments of the oxen. So those wooden instruments were placed on the fire to get the fire burning hot for the meal, for the feast. He was cutting his ties at God's command. But there's one more thing. Elisha's early work in the work of God was in service to the Lord and Elijah. You see, he took the place of a servant. For example, at the end of verse number 21, then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. The word minister means serve. He served him. He became his servant, his helper. He submitted himself to him. He needed a humble heart for this, to take instruction, to be obedient. That was part of his training. At no point somebody coming into the work of God with a heart full of pride, right? I'm here now, everything's fixed, and I'll sort this, and I'll sort that. Lord doesn't want that. Lord wants somebody who's humble enough to sit before him and say, Lord, I do not understand. I do not know the way ahead. And I pray, Lord, you'll spare me from my plans and give me your will. We need to be humble enough. Humble enough to say when we're wrong. Humble enough to apologize. Humble enough to realize that I have more potential of wrecking God's work than to do of encouraging it. And therefore, Lord, keep me close to thee. And I'll tell you, a humble heart and serving another man, that does not bring the praise and the glory of man. But I'll tell you what it does bring, the smile of God. Because he was doing what God had called him to do in the time God had called him to do it. Where God had placed him, that was his ministry. A friend, if you're saved this morning, where God has placed you, that is your ministry. Maybe you're in the home. That's the place of ministry. You have a ministry toward your parents. Parents toward your children. Spouse toward your other spouse. You have a ministry of hospitality as you open your home and show love for Christ. In your workplace where God has placed you, whether you're employer or employee, whether it's in business, whether it's in the service, 
It needs to be with integrity. It needs to be a ministry there that you are living and working and serving Christ. In the church that God has placed you, there needs to be faithful attending. There needs to be prayer. There needs to be giving. There needs to be serving. There needs to be godliness. These things are your ministry. You have a ministry toward this congregation. Do you know that? You minister unto others by your faithfulness and your godliness. And we ought to do that. And therefore, in our land also, by the way, for the Lord has called us to live in Northern Ireland. The Lord has called us to live in Northern Ireland in 2021. A year, uh, along with 2020, we'll be reading about history books until we're called home. And it's confusing. It's discouraging at times. But God has called us to live here. Here and now. And therefore, there's a work for us to do. And there's a, there's a ministry for us to conduct. In this land, we could be honest citizens. Obedient citizens with a faithful testimony. We have a ministry in this land as well. So the prayer of God's people ought to be like Elijah, which I believe, or Elisha, which I believe he was praying before Elijah came. Lord, what would you have me to do for you? Reveal your will. And may the Lord place it upon our hearts to be the best husband or wife we could be, the parent or the child we could be, the best employer or employee the best church member that we possibly could be, all to the glory of God. Not to get the pat on the back, but to have the smile of God and the blessing of God upon us. A friend, if you're not willing to do the little things, you are not ready for the greater. If you're not willing to do the little things, you're not ready for the greater. Sometimes it's all guns go whenever there's a mission and there's public outreach. And then you see for a normal prayer meeting night. No. It's not exciting. It's not seen. Be faithful in the little things. Be faithful in your home, the little things. Faithful in your church and your workplace, friend, that will be noticed. God will bless that. God will use that. He was called to be serving. He was called to be humble. He was called to submit. And so are we. Friend, do what God calls you to do. If he places you in a position, we have to serve under someone. Obey by his grace, those in authority over you. My conclusion is this. And I suppose maybe this may be focused more so on the life of Elijah today than it did in the life of Elisha, but we need it to understand that, to find out who it was that was going to be training Elisha and how he was called. But at the start of our message, Elijah was in despair, and he felt like life wasn't worth living. But the Lord spoke. The Lord gave him instruction. He obeyed it. Friend, what a difference. What a difference Jesus makes when he speaks to our hearts. Dear Christian, is there someone this morning in need for a word from the Lord? Please don't continue in fear or self-pity or despair. When there is a word for you today, there is one who's a word for you if you will come to him and listen. And the final thing I just want to say is this. Look at verse 11. And he said, this is the Lord, he said, go. And then look also at verse number 15. And the Lord said unto him, Go. Friend, there's a, there's a place for you to be today. Where's God calling you to go? Is it out of the closet to pray? Is it back into the paths of righteousness? Is it into fellowship with another believer? Into a place of obedience where he calls you be willing to go. Maybe there's someone this morning you're not seeing. You say, well, how does this apply to me? Well, unless you was called by Elijah, by God through Elijah. Friend, if you're not saved today, the Lord is calling you. Every time the Bible is open, we're reminded that God speaks. God speaks today and he's speaking to sinners. Friend, there's a life of blessing. There's a life of victory. There's a life of great blessedness for the person who comes and turns from sin and puts your trust in Christ. Don't live out of what seems to be the glitter of the world because I'll tell you, it'll come to a better end. You'll curse the things that you loved the things that you thought were worth living, but your soul is down in hell. And therefore, respond just like Elijah. I'll go. Lord, I'll come to thee this morning. Lord, I want a life that's truly worth living. I want 
sins forgiven. I want joy, peace with God, and assurance of a home in heaven. These things are only found through Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the commencement in our study of the life of Elisha. Oh Lord, we've been reminded this morning that it's not an easy road. We're traveling to heaven, but praise God, the Savior walks beside us. He gives us joy every day. He gives us help on the journey and we rejoice in the fact that, Lord, we are never alone. Even when we feel like we're alone, even when we feel in despair to the point where, Lord, I just wish I could go home. Lord, thou art there. Thank you, Lord, for every provision you have given to your children, especially those we never asked for. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings you bestowed upon us that we never sought, the encouragements we never pleaded for. Oh, Lord, how good and merciful and great thou art. Make us like Elisha, Lord, humble hearts, serving hearts, submitting hearts. Help us, Lord, to shine brightly for Christ. And should there be one in this gallery not saved, I pray that this day thou wilt draw them unto thyself. Thank you, Lord, there's a Savior who shed his blood to save the sinner. And he will not turn any away. Who repent from their sin. Come by faith to him. Take us home, Lord, in the fear of God and in the favor of God. And Lord, for our service this evening, we pray for that double portion. Let there be a mighty outpouring of the Spirit of God and a real move among the hearts of the unsaved. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.